near the armaments factory is the Army's training and administrative office. Most Kurds don't take kindly to office work or to becoming bureaucrats. They're born to the freedom of the mountains and the rule of the gun, and they lavish extraordinary care on their rifles. Kurds pride themselves on being crack marksmen. They shoot for fun as well as in anger. The variety of their guns would grace an armaments museum. Most of them are captured from the Iraqis, but many have come into their hands through private deals in Europe on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Tires, scarce and essential, are also carefully tended. The Peshmergas have to eat when and where they can, and they live mainly off the land. Every farmer gives 10% of his harvest to the troops, and Kurds outside Iraq donate 10% of their income to the cause. Prisoners are given the same food as the army. The Kurdish army is limited to 25,000 because that's all they have arms for. Only a favored few also can be provided with horses. The Peshmergas know every inch of their countryside by night or day. Most need little training, though some of them have been trained in Russia or with the Iraqi army. Kurds put the number of Iraqi defectors who have joined them at over 750 last year alone. By and large, the outside world has shown little interest in helping the Kurds in their remote war. To help spread knowledge and encourage support, the Kurds have set up a radio station in a big cave, Radio Free Kurdistan. Since this film was taken, it's been hit by Iraqi hunter jets. The station transmits on the shortwave band twice each day. Programs last 15 minutes and go out at peak Iraqi listening hours. The station's technical equipment is mostly American and reasonably up to date. The range of the station is about 500 miles and covers Baghdad. Getting spare parts if anything goes wrong is a major problem, especially if the generators fail. The chief editor and master scriptwriter has a hut to himself in which he prepares the patriotic appeals which are Radio Free Kurdistan's staple diet. His message is put over with passion by the station announcer. This is the voice of Kurdistan, the voice of the red blood which is shed on the mountains. The voice which tells the enemy clearly, we seek freedom or death. The voice before which the enemy cower. Almost as soon as programs start, Baghdad tries to drown the announcer by playing on the same wavelength a top Arab pop song. But the message gets through to the faithful just the same. Now that the war, for the moment at any rate, is over, Radio Free Kurdistan will have to adopt a new style. Aggression will have to change to words of peace and reconciliation. The same applies to the Kurds' other propaganda organ. From a mountain hut, they publish their monthly Kurdistan news. It's printed in Arabic and translated to English and French for outside consumption. It makes some startling claims for Kurdish successes. In 1965 alone, 8,000 Iraqis killed, nine planes shot down, and 300 vehicles destroyed.
but no figures for Kurdish losses ever find their way from the antiquated German printing press. Last month's issue gave what the Kurds claim to be Iraq's final plans for exterminating Kurdish forces. This month's edition will no doubt reflect Bazani's attitude towards peace with Iraq. He's endorsed Baghdad's 12 peace points. These go some way to meeting Kurdish demands, but only in general terms. And there's one big stumbling block. Until his demands have been met, Bazani refuses to give up his illegal private army. Peace talks are going on at Ruindus. If they fail, the Kurds may soon be listening again to the bellicose verses of their poet laureate. <laughs>